Hey everybody, it is Thursday afternoon. I'm taking advantage of another fantastic day in Fort Lauderdale, South Florida, to test out my new camera to see how it does for, uh, for vlogging. I'm not very experienced in vlogging, so this is all just an experiment to me. But I'm actually here also because I've started my second buddy read. This one is with Claire of Claire Reads Books. And if you don't know my history with Claire's, we met recently because we had a very different um, experience with reading Elif Bataman's The Idiot. And then we just started talking. We thought we should try to read something together to see how our tastes, how our reactions to an another book um, might fare. And she suggested reading Thomas Hardy's Jude the Obscure because I'm a, a Thomas Hardy fan, but that's actually one that I've never read. Jude the Obscure is actually Hardy's very last novel before he gave up on fiction. The reaction of the Victorian audience and society was censorious enough that he just abandoned fiction and turned to uh, mostly poetry after that. And it's one I thought I had read, but now that I've read the first of the six parts of it, um, it's very clear to me that I've never read it before. Um, it's it's interesting because I read his first serious novel not too long ago, Far From the Madding Crowd, which is his first, not serious novel, but his first novel that really seems to be important. And then this is now his last novel. And there's a huge difference in styles. If anything, his more mature work is much simpler in prose style. It's much more direct. Uh, it's absolutely gorgeous prose. Uh, some people struggle with Hardy because his his diction is his diction and his syntax are so um, dense and hard to read sometimes that it turns people off. But I'm finding in Jude that it's so much less so than it was when I was reading Far From the Madding Crowd. Um, so really quickly, I'm not gonna try to uh, save you from spoilers. When you're talking about classic books, I don't really see much point in that. Uh, if, if you don't want any spoilers, probably don't watch the rest of this video because I'm not going to hide from that. The point of doing this video this way is that I'm going to talk about each of the six parts as I finish it. And so naturally I'm going to be talking about some of the events that happen in each of the parts. The book opens when Jude Fawley is a young boy, probably nine or ten. Um, he lives with his great aunt. We find out that his parents are both dead. Uh, she is not particularly keen on him being there. Uh, she makes that very clear. She wishes he would just do something else. And in fact, when the local schoolmaster leaves their village to go to the town of Christminster to become a scholar and go to university, Jude is very taken with the idea and his great aunt basically says, why don't you go with him? You know, get out of my house, that kind of thing. But of course, there's no practical way for him to do that. But it fires in him the possibility of books and education. And he decides for himself that he's going to come up with a plan to go to Christminster, to become a university scholar, and then eventually to join the clergy, maybe even become a bishop, he dares the dream. And so the next several chapters are him putting into place this plan to acquire some books, to teach himself as much as he can, uh, the rudiments of both Latin and Greek, pretty, pretty uh, bold enterprise for a young child with no tutor. Um, but he starts doing that and he puts into plan uh, a way to get himself to Christminster. And that is he sets himself up as an apprentice with a local stonemason and is trying to earn enough money that he eventually can go to Christminster and to university. When he's 19, as often happens to 19 year olds, he meets a woman, Arabella Dawn. Uh, she's a local country woman. Her parents raise pigs. Um, and he's attracted to her, but he's not interested in a wife. He just wants to spend time with her. And she sets the trap and her friends goad her into it. She first seduces him and then hints to him that she's pregnant. So of course, Jude does what's expected of him and he marries her. And from the very start, of course, it's a disaster. He is resentful that he's basically having to give up on his dream of scholarship. She's resentful that he's not somebody else. She 
chastises him for not making enough money to support them and he says well you know being an apprentice isn't exactly the kind of salary that you can raise a family on and they grow quickly disillusioned with one another when he finds out one she's not pregnant and two she's not very nice um, they have a blow up um, over something fairly trivial uh, but they have a blow up she storms out of the house and starts telling people that he's being abusive to her when he has not been um, and he goes off for a walk he walks and goes and visits his great aunt um, she said something during the fight that was pretty hateful about his own parents something that he has never heard before and so he's asking the great aunt about it and he finds out that they separated almost immediately after he was born and his mother committed suicide and then his father went off to another town and eventually dies of some kind of a disease possibly the flu we don't really know and that's how he ended up with his great aunt and his great aunt makes the association with some other family members who have not had happy marriages either and she said the follies are just not meant to be married and that's kind of a theme that you can see coming throughout this book right from the very beginning of the book and so he goes back that night to the house and Arabella's gone. She's left him a note that she's gone to friends and she's not coming back. And he finds out a few days later that she's decided her parents are going to emigrate to Australia because they're not making it financially in England. And she's decided to go with them. And he actually fully supports that. And so by the end of part one, he's back much wiser, much sadder, but he kind of renews his hope for this dream in Christminster and so at the end of book one you see him looking towards the future as a way of rekindling that dream even though he's lost a number of years in making it a reality. Uh, so you've got several different ideas here. The epigraph to the book is from one of the apocryphal books of the Bible and it basically talks about the things men have often done because of women and I cringe a little bit because Hardy seems to be really laying the blame of a lot of things at the feet of Arabella, but women by proxy. And I get the sense that there's probably some, maybe not hidden, but there is some judgment here about women that is not totally flattering to Thomas Hardy. Um, but it's more that Jude is such a sensitive, sympathetic character and that we, we are immediately prone to feel sorry for him, not because of the way she treats him, but because of the way everything treats him. He's a very sensitive child. Uh, one scene which precipitates the fight with Arabella is he has to slaughter a pig that they've raised, and she wants to do it very slowly so it doesn't affect the, the, the taste of the meat. He can't bear to see the thing suffer, so he slaughters it very quickly, even though that damages the meat somewhat. So. He is a, a super sensitive, nice, kind, caring guy, um, but she abuses him in those ways by entrapping him, lying to him about being pregnant. She knew she wasn't pregnant. She pretends she didn't know, but she knew. Um, and so our sympathies are clearly with Jude, but you get the sense that this book is partially going to be about that idea of marriage. And I've read just enough about what happens later in the book to know that that does come up again later in the book. So. That's part one. Uh, I am thoroughly enjoying it. I'm doing this kind of a, a combination of text and audio. Uh, and the narrator for the audio is wonderful, but he reads very slowly, so it's taking quite a while. He, he reads far slower than I would read it if I were reading it to myself. But uh, I'll close here, and then I'll be back with you after I finish part two. Have a good afternoon. Hey everybody, just a quick catch up. It's late Saturday morning. Uh, I finished part two of Jude the Obscure last night and I'm about to head down to Miami to spend the afternoon playing some golf. Uh, so I thought I'd do a quick check, uh, check in with you before I lose the rest of the day. Um, part two got a little, well it gets a little weird, but it's setting up what becomes the big controversy for Victorian society uh, with this novel. Um, there's a three-year gap at the end of part one, during which time Jude is finishing his apprenticeship. 
And so part two picks up as his apprenticeship has ended and he's going to make his way to Christminster to try to put into effect his plan to go to university and eventually enter the, um, the church. Um, he knows that he only knows two people in Christminster though and one of them he's never actually spoken to. He sees a picture on his great aunt's I don't know, mantle, bookshelf, something. And he asks who it is. It's of a young woman who's roughly his age and he's quite taken with her beauty. And his great aunt tells him that that's his cousin, Sue. Uh, and she says that there's been bad blood in the family. You should leave her alone and stay away from her. Uh, and so Jude goes on to Christminster. There's a, a wonderfully lyrical section when he first arrives there uh, where he's walking through some of the empty buildings, or he's walking through the courtyards of the empty buildings of the university university and imagining all the great people who have tread those paths and have had great and lofty thoughts that he has read. Um, and then he finds out it's not quite so easy to put his plans into effect. Um, he ends up getting a job working in stonemasonry, which is what his apprenticeship was in. And he sees Sue a couple of times, but he's hesitant to make himself known to her. Uh, she finds out that her cousin that she doesn't know is in Christminster. So she seeks him out and they do meet. And he is very quickly obsessed with her. He falls in love with her very quickly. And of course, this is really difficult for obvious reasons. One, he's still married to Arabella, even though she's abandoned him. If this was a 21st century novel, no one would care. She's left, she's in Australia, he's a free agent. But this is Victorian England. Um, so he knows that that's an impediment to him ever loving again. Plus, she's his first cousin. Uh, and he knows that these things are a problem and he should not fall in love with her, but he, he can't help himself. He just does. She seems like a very uh, warm, uh, open, gentle person, very much like Jude is. And so he's attracted to her. Uh, and just in conversations with her, he mentions the other person he knows in Christminster, which of course was his old schoolmaster from some 15 years ago. And she said, uh, I don't think there's anybody here by that name who is in the clergy, but there's an old schoolmaster nearby of that name. And so they go visit him. And of course, it is, it is his old schoolmaster. He, his dream of university didn't work either. And he doesn't even really remember Jude. Um, but then they reacquaint themselves with each other. And Jude actually helps get Sue a job as the assistant schoolmaster in um, Phillotson's school. And then that creates more problems because Jude starts to figure out that his former schoolmaster, Phillotson, is also in love with Sue. And so by the end of book two, Jude has been spurned by the universities he's applied to. Four of the five that he wrote letters to simply just did not answer him. And the fifth one basically said, you should stay in your place. Stay as a, as a worker, as a laborer, which breaks his heart. And he gets very depressed, stops going to work, loses his job. He's convinced that he's lost Sue as well. And so the end of part two, which is only about a third of the way into the book, he is thoroughly depressed and not in a good place at all. And for a Hardy novel, that's where they often end. So for this to only be a third of the way through, I'm a little confused about where he's planning to take us. Um, but that's, that's where it stands. We're a third of the way through. Uh, I'm not gonna get any reading done today. I've got plans even after golf this afternoon for dinner this evening with some friends. And so I'm hoping to cram a good bit of reading in tomorrow and try to get part three and part four. All right, so I'll check in with you after part three. Talk to you soon, bye. Hey everyone, it's Tuesday afternoon. Um, I'm sitting outside in between my apartment building and the river, um, just enjoying a nice calm afternoon. It's not too windy for a change out here. Um, I finished part three of Jude the Obscure last night. Um, I'm really having trouble carving out reading time lately. Um, the number one distraction for me the last week or so is I've started watching more and more booktube channels and I'm finding that I'm spending more time watching booktube videos than I actually am reading, which is not a balance I really want to have going forward. And I'm not sure what the antidote is for that. I hate to, to unsubscribe from any of the channels that I enjoy and I feel compelled to watch every video that comes across. Uh, so I'll figure out something. Uh, 
to, to reclaim some of my reading time. Uh, so between between booktube and some real life events where I've actually had to leave my apartment, God forbid, um, I haven't been reading as much. I should be done with this book by now, but as it is, I'm actually only halfway through. Um, the whole novel's 400 pages and I'm right at 200 pages now. Um, part three is where a lot of the complications in the plot start making themselves known. Uh, if you remember, at the end of part two, Jude was at a very low point. Um, he was worried that Mr. Phillotson was going to take Sue away from him. Uh, he had just lost his job as a, a stonemason, and so things were not looking good for him. And at the beginning of part three, um, he finds out that Sue is leaving um, Christminster to go to Melchester. She's going to a teacher training college in Melchester for a two-year program. And shortly after she gets there, she kind of begs him to come see her because she's tremendously lonely, which of course, that's all the excuse he needs. But he's also been talking to a local priest about his disappointment at not getting in at the university. Um, and being overlooked in all his plans. And the, the, the priest says, well, you don't have to do the traditional university route. If you really want to enter the church, you can go in as a licentiate and just go to a divinity school. And so that idea suddenly is very appealing to Jude because he can do that in Melchester where Sue is. So he does, he goes to Melchester. And so they're in the same city again, but he finds out very shortly after getting there, the big complication is that Sue has agreed to marry Phillotson at the end of this two-year training program. And he feels, Jude feels like it's kind of his fault. He feels like he drove her into that when he got really depressed and drunk and kind of laid out his grief on her, her shoulder one night. Uh, and so he's, he still has some hope because she leads him to believe that she cares about him in more than just a familial way. Um, so he still has some hope, but things do get complicated. Um, he takes Sue on a Sunday jaunt. They, they go to visit different places and they mess up the train schedule and they don't get back in time. They miss the last train to get back to Melchester. And so they end up spending the night at a shepherd's house with his family. Uh, nothing untoward there at all, but they don't get back for her to check into the college, which is a very strict college. And so when she does get back the next morning, the college basically puts her under arrest. They essentially lock her into a cell and she can't stand that. She's, it drives her crazy that she's being judged for something that she has not done. And so she escapes. She literally breaks out of the college, essentially swims her way across this large stream or river and shows up on Jude's doorstep soaking wet. And so naturally he brings her in, um, puts her to bed so she won't get sick because she's been drenched and cold and he takes care of her for a couple days. When she goes back, to the teacher college, they have expelled her. She's been kicked out. And Jude doesn't think that's such a bad idea anyway because he wasn't really fond of the program. But what that does do is it encourages Phillotson to speed up the, the clock on his engagement to Sue. And he convinces her to marry him in a couple of weeks rather than waiting two years, which of course is devastating news to Jude. And in a way, she's almost cruel to Jude without meaning to be in that she asks Jude to be the one to give her away at the wedding because he's really her only relative around there. She, she does not speak to her father. Uh, and Jude does the right thing, he agrees to, and she ends up getting married and moving away some 15, 20 miles um, with Phillotson. And so at the end of the, the part three, they meet for the first time since the wedding and Jude gets the sense that she is not happy about being married. And to make things more complicated, right before he sees Sue again, Jude runs into Arabella. She has come back from Australia. She's been back for a couple months. He doesn't, he didn't know that. He runs into her, she's tending bar at a local inn or pub 
and they have a conversation and go away for an evening to talk about what their life is going to be. Hardy doesn't make it clear if they had more than just a conversation, but Jude feels guilty enough that you almost think they did. Um, but then he finds out from Arabella that when she was in Australia, she married somebody else there. So she's married twice now. Um, and Jude basically leads her to believe that he doesn't think that they have a future together because he's still in love with Sue. And so her husband from Australia follows her there, finds her, and they're gonna go open a pub together in another town. Um, and so Jude is essentially done with Arabella, but she's still in his life in a way that makes him very uncomfortable because he feels legally bound to her. So part three is a whole set of complications, as you expect, uh, if you follow the old um, diagram of narrative arc, this is the rising action for sure with all the different uh, conflicts being played out. Um, so I'm halfway through the book. I am gonna try to read part four today, but every time I've had a plan to read a, a big section something has interrupted the plan so we'll see if i can stick to it uh, but i'm going to enjoy the sun out here a little bit longer uh, look at the river for a few more minutes and then head back upstairs um, to my couch and read part four talk to you soon well it's tuesday night and believe it or not i actually did manage to read part four today um Part four is really interesting and it opens up more questions than it answers for me. Um, it very, be, very quickly became clear to Phillotson that Sue didn't love him and that their marriage was always going to be very difficult. And she actually, very boldly I thought, asks him at one point if he would allow her to leave and go be with Jude. And if not that, at least would he allow her to be, to live separate from him, even if it's in his own house. And he agrees to that initially. But shortly after that, he mistakenly wandered into the bedroom that they used to share, um, but which is now hers, now that they're living separately, and it frightened her so much that she jumped out of the window. And it wasn't a first floor window. Fortunately, she wasn't seriously hurt. Um, and he he realizes, Phillotson realizes at that point that she's never going to love him and he's just being cruel, keeping her to the legal name of their marriage. And so he agrees to let her go. And so she goes to Jude. Uh, she's a little bit cold and distant with Jude at first because it's also confusing and also uh, new and undetermined how she should react. And they go to Aldbrinkham, uh, a nearby town, because Jude feels that will be better than being in Melchester where everybody knows him. And he's booked a room for them because they're going to arrive late on the train. And he's booked a room for them at the Temperance Hotel. And she's a little bit offended that he's booked a single room for the two of them. And so he says, fine, we'll, we'll stay somewhere else, whatever you want. And so they hire a, a young porter to find them two hotel rooms. And he does. And it turns out to be the same hotel that Jude had been to with Arabella. Which, of course, Sue finds out about and is distraught as if Jude is playing her somehow. She's, she's kind of hypocritical here. She's, she's cold to him, but she doesn't want him with anybody else. And, so, and Jude gets a little frustrated with her. He says, I love you to death, but you're driving me crazy, woman. Uh, and she realizes he's right. And then he tells her that Arabella has written him a letter. She's actually asking him for a divorce as a kindness to her so she can legitimately marry her second husband from Australia. And Jude, of course, is willing to do that. He's not gonna, he's not gonna um, report her to the police as being a bigamist and get her in trouble. He's just going to go through the process of the divorce to allow her. And uh, Sue ends up being, okay, I'm, I'm happy about that. Shortly after that, it switches back to Phillotson. When people in um, Shaston, where he teaches, 
start to figure out that Sue's gone, a lot of talk happens, especially from the maid who worked for Phillotson and Sue, who knows what has happened. And the school that he works for gets morally outraged that he's acted this way, and they demand that he resign. And he says, no, if, if you want to fire me, you're going to have to fire me. And so they do. They fire him. Uh, and he gets physically ill from this, and his friend Gillingham, a schoolmaster from a neighboring town, writes a quick letter to Sue, uh, which has to go through several mail stops to find her, um, telling her that Phillotson is very ill. And so she comes to see if he's okay and finds out he's not nearly as ill as Gillingham said. And of course, Phillotson says, I forgive you. You know, please stay. I, you know, I'll be happy to have you back. And she says, no, I can't. And she leads him to believe that she is already now Jude's as a wife, if not in legal terms, at least in practical ones. And she actually isn't. She's not sleeping with Jude. They have not become a couple in that sense. Um, but she lets him believe that so she can leave. And so she goes back to Jude. And so at the very end of this book, uh, at the end of this part. She and Jude are together, but they're still trying to find their way into whatever relationship they're going to have. And Phillotson is starting to think that maybe he should also do what Jude is doing in letting Arabella get a divorce. He starts to think maybe I should allow her to be divorced too because she belongs with Jude and she should marry him. Um, there's still two parts of the book left, though, and knowing Hardy, this is not going to end well. Um, but it's fascinating, the twists and turns that Hardy builds into the story. It's so much like the twists and turns that he built into Tess of the Durbervilles, and why I love that novel so much. It's just every time you think Tess is going to get a break, something horrible happens that she can't control. Um, and that's part of what... Hardy's worldview is all about. So anyway, uh, that's where we are. I finished part four. I'll attack part five tomorrow. And depending on how the day goes, who knows? I'm not going to make any promises. Maybe even part six, but we'll see. Uh, another day or two and I should be finished with this. I'll talk to you again after part five. Bye. Hey everybody, it's Thursday morning. Um, I finished part five late last night, too late to, to film anything. I was barely keeping my eyes open when part five finished. Um, I've lost a little patience with Sue as a character in the last two parts. Uh, she's a very intelligent woman. Uh, she's well educated, uh, but she is so entirely timid about everything to do with relationships that she is essentially um, she's hurting Jude. Uh, Jude has made no bones about the fact that he loves her and now that both she and Jude are divorced they legally can marry and Jude asks her if she wants to marry and she doesn't really which is fine she, per she perfectly has a reason not to want to marry. Um, but she expects Jude to live with her in a completely platonic slash sweetheart relationship, which Jude is not happy about. Uh, and this goes on for most part of a year now. And then Arabella shows up because she wants to talk to Jude about something she says about business. And that sends Sue into a complete frenzy and she agrees to marry Jude. So basically she's doing the same thing with Jude that she did with Phillipson. She agrees to marry him when she doesn't really want to because she thinks it'll make him happy. But of course it's not going to make him happy if she's reluctant. Uh, and so they are all but at the, the registry office to get married when she backs out again. And Jude is completely understanding. He goes, if this isn't what you want, that's fine. He's doing everything he can to make sure she's happy. But she goes the other way too. The minute Arabella shows up in any scene, Sue freaks out and gets uber jealous at him. Um, 
and she can't have it both ways in my mind and that's starting to really frustrate me um, the big news in part five the big surprise to me I did not see this coming um, is that Jude has a child with Arabella that he didn't know about that was the news that she wanted to share with him uh, Arabella does go on and get married to her Australian second husband um, but she doesn't feel like she can care for the child she doesn't want to leave the child any longer with her parents who don't really want to care for it she just basically says it's your son here he's yours and the kid shows up on, on Jude's doorstep one night uh, and so Jude and Sue are basically his new parents um, that really hasn't been developed a whole lot it's just kind of no another plot twist that gets thrown in there so we're down to the final part about 80 pages left in the edition that I'm reading and I am struggling at this point to imagine what horrific fate awaits them because it, it's a hardy novel something bad has to happen at the end um, but it, it is very interesting that he is very clearly making a, a polemic against marriage and in favor of a more natural relationship and that's one of sue's big qualms about getting married is she thinks the very legal contract aspect of it ruins any chance of a real relationship and jude kind of agrees with her there but he's so conventional he doesn't know what to do other than that uh, and i think this is why we're getting into the territory where hardy's victorian audience flipped out and the reaction to this book was so negative that Hardy gave up writing fiction and spent the last 30 years of his life just writing poetry. Um, but it's, it's very interesting. The prose is great. I'm loving that part of it. It's still taking forever to read between my distractions and the audio version. Uh, I think the guy who does the audio version uh, has a wonderful voice. He does the characters very well. He does all the, the accents very well. But it's just going so slow. I find myself even on a slightly increased speed, I find myself wishing he would hurry up. Uh, so I'm not sure if I'll do this for the next Hardy book if it's this long. Um, so, one part to go. I hope to finish it either today or tomorrow morning. Uh, one of the things that I wrote to Claire about in our Twitter conversations was that there are certain passages throughout the book where Hardy's tone is a little confusing to me. I'm not sure if it's a character who's being very patronizing to all women um, or if it's Hardy himself and I, I still haven't figured out uh, how I feel about that um, I'm trying to think in his other novels if I felt the same way and at times I did and at times I didn't so I'm, I'm still unsure of how I think about his attitude towards women he's very very patronizing very paternalistic almost misogynistic in some in some places uh, and it's all stereotypes of course all right, so that's it for me today. I'll talk to you again when I finish part six and when I hear back from Claire uh, and have her responses to some of the things we talked about in our, in our Twitter exchanges. Talk to you soon, bye. Hey everybody, it's Friday afternoon. I've finished with Jude the Obscure, or it's possible that it's finished with me. Um, as I suspected, having read some Thomas Hardy before, it ends in a devastatingly dark fashion. I'm not going to tell you what the final blow is, but it's pretty devastating. Um, but finishing up, I can see why the late Victorian audience had such a visceral and hostile response to this novel. Um, it is a clear challenge to the point of marriage. It's a devastating criticism of religion. And it also calls into question the class structure that's so much a part of Victorian society. It's getting towards the end of Queen Victoria's reign in 1895. She died, I think, in 1901. Um, but Hardy is challenging all those things that are so ingrained in the society that the reviewers did not handle it well, and some of the reviews were quite vitriolic. And even though Hardy lived another 45 years after this book came out, it's the last novel he wrote. And it's kind of heartbreaking in that sense, too. I wonder how many other novels, how many other great novels he might have produced had he not abandoned fiction in favor of poetry and a few, a few plays. Um, but it's, it is definitely 
worth reading. I, I love the fact that his more mature prose is a little bit less dense than his early prose. I talked about that earlier. Uh, having read Far From the Madding Crowd just a couple of weeks ago and now reading Jude the Obscure, um, it's much less threatening to try to make sense of some of his long paragraphs. Don't get me wrong, he still has this flowery description of nature throughout his books. Um, but it is a little bit less daunting than his earlier works. So I've, I've really enjoyed reading this, although it absolutely took forever. This is the book that would not end, and I don't think it's because the book is so long. I not sh I'm not sure as much as I enjoyed the audio version of this, I'm not sure that's really a great plan for a long Victorian novel or a long, even a modestly long Victorian novel like this. It just extended the period of reading so long that I, took twice as long to read this as I had originally thought it would take, which is fine. It's not like I have anywhere to go, um, but it's maybe a little bit too long for that one book. Uh, I'm waiting to hear Claire's thoughts on some of the issues that we've talked about um, on, on Twitter in our messages back and forth about society, about my frustration with Sue at the end. Oh my God, in the last two parts, Sue just becomes this horribly insipid, whiny, unsympathetic character in my eyes. I could have had a lot of sympathy for her stances early in the book, but after the unspeakable happens to both Sue and um, Jude in, towards the end, they flip-flop completely in character in the sense that Jude started off as the one who was kind of superstitious and religious, and he has gradually come to abandon that in favor of the views that he and Sue had held together, but Sue does the exact opposite. She goes batshit crazy religious on him and just completely ignores what she knows to be true in favor of what she assumes society expects of her, and it... it eventually it kills Jude. I mean, it, it puts him into his grave earlier. He dies before he's even 30. And I'm sure that's a spoiler, but it's not exactly something that's going to surprise you. It's a tragedy about Jude. Um, but it's just, it's a heartbreaking book in, the, in those ways. It's, it's heartbreaking also in the sense that it ended Hardy's career. That's what breaks my heart the most. So anyway, that's kind of my wrap up for uh, Jude the Obscure. I have a feeling when I edit this, it's gonna be way too long, but since it's my first vlog, I wasn't sure exactly how to keep it under control. Uh, if you liked this kind of a format, let me know and I'll do it occasionally for other books. I don't think I would wanna do this on every book I read, um, but it's been interesting doing it in sections as I read it. All right, I'll get this edited and posted and I will talk to you soon. Thanks very much for watching, bye.